Hello and welcome to Outlaw Bookseller, Steve Lee Andrews here and today we're going to Hay on Wye again and yes I'm with the mighty Jules Burt. at work. Yeah. <laughs> so the Hay on Y trip with Jules Burt. Months in the planning and of course I've had Covid so I'm still absolutely exhausted from it. The fatigue from it is really sort of debilitating I must say. But it's the day after and I thought I should shoot the fellas in the book hall and edit them in. I didn't actually shoot very much at Hay itself as you'll see because I've done two Hay videos this year and quite frankly I was so exhausted by halfway through the day that <laughs> I couldn't get around to shooting anymore and I did shoot some for Jules as well and you'll see that in his videos. So there'll be a link at the end of this one to the first of the two Hay videos he's going to put up. If you don't know who Jules Burt is, he's a YouTuber, he's got a lot of subscribers, he's been doing it for about three years and Jules and I used to work together um, 11 years ago, we were book buyers for the same company and we worked together for a few months, about three or four months, in a short period of time where we clicked straight away and we really got on and um, it's good to be back in touch with him because I haven't seen him for years and um, we probably will do some more collabs as time goes on. So that's who Jules Burt is. So if you're not familiar with his channel, do look it up. Um, he's a collector of books primarily. He also likes sort of computer games, um, die-cast toys, all sorts of stuff. So if you're also a collector and a fan of memorabilia and quality stuff, he really knows his own ends and he's a great guy as well. So it was fantastic fun to, to go to he and it was his first time there, which is absolutely amazing really, because he lives down on the South Coast and I'm a bit closer. So there we go. So this is a gap filling time. Really pleased with this Philippi hive. Looking for that on AB the other day and I couldn't find a decent one. That's a really nice one. I've got a gap in my Gregory Benford. This really, I should have had ages ago. I have read it. I used to think of Golanx editions, the Jim Burns triptych covers. And just filling some of my Bob Shaw gaps. When I looked at how many Bob Shaws I didn't have, I was quite surprised. Grand Zero Man, of course, reissued as the Peace Machine, which I read in hardcover the other day. I love the original title. This is an uncommon show. You don't see this very often at all. So it's really nice to see that in pan. Shadow of Heaven's another early one I didn't have. So I pretty much completed my Bob Shaw collection today. I do want the one I used to have of this, but it has a giraffe on the cover, but it's really, really uncommon. And it's not a book I have at the moment. And I'm trying to complete my Sladex as well. So that's a good one. And you know, when you see these Granada Grafton Jack Vances, you've got to pick them up because they're beautiful and they're increasingly hard to find. Lovely door show, but well, look at that. It's just St. Jules now that even though I've got the Coronet one, I couldn't resist that. That's fantastic. 
James H. Schmidt. Somebody who has had their books bagged, so I tend to pick these up. And this is an uncommon book in hardcover. It was Unwin. I read it at the time and got rid of it. And um, I don't know this edition. And this is a, obviously an early 90s um, HarperCollins one. So that's great. <laughs> yeah, I've seriously <laughs> never seen you so quiet. <laughs> yeah, they just don't know where to look first. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> He was berating me earlier on. He wanted to get a coffee as soon as possible, and now you know it's like gone clean, out, clean, care. clean out of his head. The whole whole notion. <laughs> okay, so that's Cinema Bookshop done, and that was pretty good actually. Um, I filled a lot of gaps there, and uh, I didn't think I would, but and I sold some stuff, which obviously sort of um, pays for it, which is nice. So upwards and onwards. Yeah, it's a bit more overcast here today than I thought it would be. I thought it would be much sunnier, but it's okay, it's dry. And Jules is absolutely loving it. I'm really enjoying his company. And um, some good scores there. Yeah, fantastic stuff. Yeah, so I did some selling, as always, at cinema. And um, that'll pay for the sort of coffee and cake. And I paid towards some books as well and what have you. So that's really nice. And it's just great to come here with another bibliophile. And there he is, he's sorting himself out. Look at that, professional till the end. No messing. <laughs> this is what they want. <laughs> so I thought I'd talk you through what I picked up. And as you saw there, the first section in Cinema Bookshop, that's usually where I sell my books when I nip over there. And they've always got some SF. These days, um, I tend to focus almost exclusively on looking at the SF because I can't usually spend more than a few hours in here. It is difficult to get to, even if you only leave a couple of hours drive away. And really have to sort of stay overnight or what have you to do it sort of in depth so I just focused on the SF and at cinema bookshop this is what I got you saw the little sort of snippet there in uh, earlier in the video but I just thought I'd talk you through things so the thing I was most pleased with as you probably gathered was this copy of um, speaking of dinosaurs by Philip E High in Venture SF which was uh, ventures an imprint of Arrow and it was around in the late 80s and the whole point of venture was that it was going to be sort of back to the sort of no nonsense space opera action adventure sort of thing and they did quite a few titles i was not very keen at the time because i was a hardcore new wave literary guy so i never really invested in them but i do have quite a few of them there are some good authors and this was published originally in 1974 by robert hale so it's quite collectible and i love that title speaking of dinosaurs you know if it had just been talking about dinosaurs it would be rubbish but you know that's the euphony of the english language speaking of dinosaurs and it was in great nick you do see these around there were quite a few venture books in here actually and i was very tempted because one is on a budget and you know you've got to stay in control because it's very easy to go mad but i was really really pleased with that and broken spine um tiny bit of fading there on the v but absolutely spiffing so i was really pleased with that that was a cracker and I showed you the other ones, um, Gregory Benford and Gordon Eckland, Find the Changeling, which as I say wasn't in my um, Benford collection. I probably had it before in a different form. This is a sort of, a, this is an, a 90s edition, I would say, looking at it from Orbit. Let's have a quick look. So it did have a different cover before this. Yeah, reprinted 91. And I'm not familiar with this jacket, even though I must have been selling it at that point. So, but around about 91, I was doing a lot of mail order book selling. I wasn't working on the shop floor, I was running an international mail order book selling thing. And um, so I sort of probably missed a lot of the more routine stuff. And I would have already had it, as I say, in its, its earlier format. So, there you go. But that was very nice. Um, I also picked up this Telsey Amberden novel by James Schmitz, The Lion Game and tells the Amberton is sort of like she's like a mutant you know and she's super cute and um, there are some novellas and short stories and um, some of these are in door and this is this is Hamlin and uh, this I can tell is from I'd say late 70s maybe early 80s let's have a little look at that um, Sidgwick 79 Hamlin 79 there you go Sidgwick 76 Hamlin 79 and I do like these Hamlin books and I've noticed a lot of the things which are in door in the USA in the UK Brian Stablefoot's an example they're in Hamlin and um, very fond of these Hamlin papers they're really nice and again there's quite a few hay at the moment so I was trying to pick up some more because they are lovely and I've got some from the time of course so 
but very very nice that as i say i do have this thing coming with big cats in science fiction i don't know what that's about but the dinosaur thing i understand but the big cat thing is coming into it maybe it's being a cat owner who can say where's smudge 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 no she's not here she's never here when you want her and um, bob shaw as i said i talked about my bob shaw collection filling gaps um, as I said recently I read the peace machine which is the latest slightly revised retitled version of this ground zero man a much better title as I say so I felt as I love that title so much I should pick it up um, not a sort of hard book to get there you go and absolutely great so I have that with both titles now and I much prefer that title I don't know why they changed it why would you change it I mean I love Bob Shaw there was a certain diminution I feel of in the quality of his books as the 80s went on and the last few I wasn't so keen on and you know the sort of retitling and stuff tended to sort of you know affect my sort of feelings about it so there you go pernickety I know now the Bob Shaw this is an early one Shadow of Heaven never read this one and this is ironic because I got this um, at cinema along with the others later on I saw one which wasn't anywhere near as faded it was much nicer but that's the trouble you know you've got to grab these since you see them but if you go to hey you know maybe stick them behind the counter and would they let you do that i don't know they probably let me do it but i don't know anybody else but there you go but yeah nel a sort of late 60s early 70s and nice and slim so that filled that gap as well as i say i'm filling my bob shaw gaps for somebody i really like i'm amazed really how many i didn't have and it's because you just see them around you know and um, this nice shaw palace of eternity this is an early one again Again, not one that um, I've actually read. And it's not quite the lozenge, but it's got the lovely pan logo there. Great cover art. Look at that. Fantastic. I think that's Chris Foss. I would say the glance is Chris Foss. I'm pretty sure it is, actually. I'm sure that's in Hardware, the Chris Foss book. Lovely stuff. So I'm getting my Bob together. My best Bob score today was this Tomorrow Lies in Ambush, which is a short story collection. This is very uncommon generally. Just look what date this is from. It's obviously a 70s book. It's not a lozenge. Um, let's see. This one dates to... Good grief, they've hidden it away. So, okay. 1973. So this is just before um, the lozenge got going, but classy stuff and um, short stories and... Um, really great and I have read some of Bob's stories but not that many so um, I'm sort of kind of looking forward to this because he's you know the short stuff I have read is really really good his best book um, Other Days Other Eyes is about three novellas with sort of frame narratives and interspersions and stuff and they find this fantastic so it's a novel fixed up out of short forms which is a great way to do it so I was really pleased with that so nice nice short gaps filled there I mentioned John Sladek and as I said in the video I prefer this with the cover I used to have when I was much younger which has a giraffe on it but it's like hen's teeth you never see it this one's a lot more common these are very surreal and I remember reading this shortly after I first read Philip K Dick and I thought I was up for more weirdness but this did sort of push back at me and um, I don't think Sladek is anywhere near as good as Dick I'll be quite honest he's great you know he's fantastic stuff and um, new wave american writer born in iowa collaborated a lot with thomas m dish and he came over to london in the sort of swinging 60s new worlds period and you know worked with moorcock and new worlds and what have you and a good guy and he died quite young as well which is a shame so um that's um that's great to have have it back in the collection looking forward to reading that again because it's been a very long time and i've been trying to fill in my gaps with sladek as well i think he's somebody i've generally underrated I really like his book, The Reproductive System, Malafocker Effect. Um, very sort of spiky. He's rather like a cross between Kurt Vonnegut and his early SF days, a bit of Robert Sheckley, a lot of Philip K. Dick. But he's, he has his own voice as well, but he's definitely in that sort of ballpark. They're very, very good. And Jack Vance, of course. So Jack Vance is harder to find these days, but it wasn't too bad. There were quite a few there, actually. They had a recent acquisition section in Hay Cinema which was huge and um, that was better than their actual SF section and I pulled loads of stuff out of there and could have got a lot more so hopefully maybe I'll go back in September and clear up a few more things so um, I read these back in the 80s this is the um, you know the Durdane trilogy and this is volume two the Brave Free Men the wonderful Jim Burns jacket and I've got all three in this livery now and they form a triptych the three jackets together one picture and I don't know why I've had this for years so I read them back 
in the 80s and they're sort of ornate adventure series you know great fun so it's nice to have those in the in the proper sort of coronet edition with the lovely Jim Bins delivery and it's got number two there on it so few publishers will put the um, number of a book and its series on the spine and it's so helpful to booksellers and then they'll do it and then halfway through the series they'll stop doing it <sighs> anyway moving on with fans, as you saw, I also got a really nice edition of Showboat World, and this is the door one. And I've got Showboat World in Coronet, you know, I've Jim Burns' jacket, fantastic stuff, and this is a, a, a great little book. Um, but I saw this, and it was so beautiful, I thought, I've got to have that, because you don't actually see a lot of door stuff in Great Nick. The spine is still nice and yellow, it's unbroken. There's a little bit of marking on the front there, but absolutely beautiful. So it really, really is, so I couldn't resist that. So I had to have that, because these were all pretty cheap. And again more vans as i said in the little sort of roundup to get um them in the grafton editions from the mid 80s these are two of the demon princes books um you know the demon prince is fairly easy to get i think there's two omnibuses in print in the usa but i'm trying to get them in the um grafton livery i remember these really well they're chris foss of course fantastic stuff and uh, when i've got the lot i'm going to reread them so yeah so i was really pleased to get those because again it's the condition thing finding them you know with unbroken spines and what have you can be quite difficult difficult and as i say this is a book i read and um, when it first came out from Unwin late 80s and um, i did bulk a bit because it's got some sort of way along the spine there and i thought well i don't remember this edition either from the 90s again when i was doing mail order and then later on again in um, richard booth they had an absolutely pristine copy i already bought this one it is what it is i kind of bought this because i know if i do that it'll stop me seeking out the hardcover which i used to have um, the first hardcover edition was given to me by Jim, the Unwin rep who lived next door to me in the late 80s. And of course I sold on at one point. It's a minor cyberpunk novel. Some people would say it's a major one. Um, I personally think nearly all the cyberpunk stuff is derivative. I mean, you know, I'm very much a purist about it. Cyberpunk to me is William Gibson, a bit of Bruce Sterling, a handful of other things, John Shirley. And then the rest is kind of sort of fake, really. You know, it's it's, it's kind of ersatz in a way that new wave SF isn't. So um, people jumping on the bandwagon with either the sort of tropes and stuff. But this is OK from what I remember. And um, I should read more of Womack because I probably haven't read anywhere enough. And that's going to go on um, the reread pile. So there you go. Good fun. Ambient. Fantastic title. And the castle is open. It's never been open in my lifetime. Never seen it open. Looks like they finished the work on it. That's really good. Uh, there's Mr. Bert, as you'd expect. Wow, well, yeah. We're a bit short of time today, otherwise we've gone up a really good look in it. It's lovely to see it open at last, because it's been a long time. Now, as I might have said in my other Hay videos, there is a certain amount of mythology about Hay and Why. Officially, it still claims to have around about 25 bookshops, which is completely untrue. If you look at the little leaflet, you can get this guide there, and it's sort of got them dotted around. And one of them is actually in Brecon, which is miles away. Um, another, I think, is in Talgarth, which is a bit closer, but it's miles away. So there's also a wholesaler on there, which you can't visit. A book wholesaler sells books to other booksellers, so you can't visit it. There's something which is like a print museum. So you discount all those and you count what's actually there. There's only about 11. Um, in terms of specialists, there's a natural history bookshop, which is just out the centre of the town. There's the children's bookshop, which I wanted to get to. It's a little way up the town. It's a few hundred yards up the main drag. And we didn't have time, we didn't get that. I've been there for years and it's almost such a nice shop. So I really want to go next time I go and have a look at that and see, see what's there. Because I haven't been there for a very long time indeed. There's a map specialist. Um, so when you bring it down, there, are, there aren't that many. There's one about to open called North. A lot of the newer bookshops there tend to sort of look, they look like new bookshops and I really don't like that. And there's more of a mixture of new, remainder and second hand. And, you know, back in the day, that was anathema. You couldn't get new books in here. You could get remainders, but now it's just sort of, it's getting very mainstream that way. And that's another effect of, you know, the gentrification which is happening because of years and years and years of the um, festival where people are going along, they're seeing celebs, you know, they get the bums are on seats, you know, the celebs are what brings people to lit fests, you know, real writers don't get a heck of a lot of a look in, quite frankly. And, you know, people see how beautiful it is around there. The countryside is fantastic. It's lovely. And, you know, they sort of buy up the houses and you just don't see any locals in Hay anymore. And, um, you know, I have talked privately to some of the booksellers about this and they agree, you know, it has changed a lot. So so that's my gripes out of the way, I guess. I went then with Jules to Adiman after Cinema Bookshop 
because we thought we'd focus on the best ones because he hasn't been before we knew he'd only be there about six hours because it's a long drive it's a long day so we only went to um to cinema to adamans their bookshop uh, murder and mayhem which is a crime bookshop with some horror and richard booths so in adamans i didn't do any filming because i was busy looking at stuff to buy i had a chat with derek there and he was telling me about his woes he's been doing a house clearance the last few months and he had about six or eight boxes he said he just pulled out the crime and sf and he was sort of um quite sort of bemoaning the fact that there were some water damaged terry pratchett's which was a shame he managed to get quite a few and he does have some online so you'll see them on ab and what have you but he was hoping for a few more because of course you know big scores like that are an important thing for a good second hand bookseller because sourcing the stocks really hard you saw you don't know what you're going to get you know you never know when something will pop up you must get small stuff occasionally so big things like that are important for a professional like that you know so it's a bit of a chat and i bought some stuff one thing about book shopping in the wild of course is they call it is that it's all serendipity you know you've got your list or whatever and you think i want this this and this and you come across other stuff and you realize you want that as well so i'll show you what i got in adamans later on okay time for adiman books and murder and mayhem an old tradition which i love and enjoy so adiman what did i get well do you know i ended up buying some books i already have which i have gone into upgrading a bit simply because some of my sort of really sort of old books are really old and really worn now and um, you see things in really nice condition at, at excellent prices you have to go for it and i guess really this is the book that started me on my sf journey and that's the lost world by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. This is a pan edition. Um, I still have my John Murray one, which is in the old money, pre-decimal money, so it predates February 71. This is a nice edition. I have seen this around, and I do love the um, the John Murray one. I do have a Penguin Classic, but this was so nice. It's such good nick. And, you know, look at that. It's not toned or anything very much. Unbroken spine. It's unfaded. It's probably been in a biscuit tin or something. Um, this edition is from 1977 and it's got some big dinosaurs on the cover. And the character looks like a proper Dimorphodon, which I think is the is the flying reptile that's in the narrative. And I picked this up and I started reading a bit. And, you know, the characters and this are so brilliant. And how dare Michael Crichton and Spielberg steal the title for the second Jurassic Park film? Couldn't they think of their own? shocking anyway really really nice so i was very pleased with that and here i am swivel heading because i've got some other books in the way i'll, I'll come on to those in a moment but again <clears throat> some classic stuff really nice fontana edition of hg wells in the days of the comet and i used to have this at one point and i i had a load of really nice bosses and i got rid of because i'd read them and i didn't have the space and i thought you know they're always going to be there and i regretted it so i got this and this is um tiny little bit of a hint of a lean and broken spine lovely stuff really great stuff you know and these early wells it's they're the ones they really are so so that's good to have that back in the collection and i saw this and i just had to have it this is a penguin copy of the war of the worlds from the late 60s and i i just love this cover look at that there's the martian there and of course the martians were just really just a brain with hands and a beak you know that's when you read the text that's sort of very sort of clearly laid out that they've evolved possibly from creatures like us into sort of pure intellect hands and brain um and there's the um tripods there in the background a lovely really like that sort of um type as well and this um this is actually i had to get this because it's superb condition as you can see it's as new um it it's the price in the old money, three and six, three shillings and sixpence, which that would be 18p is the equivalent, you know, when we changed changed over, because I was about seven, so I remember it. I was taught imperial and then sort of metric, and it's really confusing, especially if you're a lunkhead with maths, as I was then. And this copy is from 67, and it's absolutely pristine, absolutely beautiful, I couldn't get over it. So I was really pleased to get that, because my own copy which is this one, my original one, which I've had for many, many, many years, um, has the same cover design. Um, it's a slightly later one because as you see, it doesn't say, notice that says a penguin book, that one doesn't. And it's different on the back as well. You can see this is the one I got from Adiman. This is my original, which is looking very battered. And really, 
I just sort of had to do it, you know, because you don't see these very often in Good Nick. And as you see, this has seen a lot of action over the years. And, um, you know, as a kid, I was sort of writing in it. I've got my, my little sort of library system, SF book number seven. So this was <laughs> SF stroke H, I guess that means horror, book seven. So I guess this was the seventh science fiction book I bought or something. And this dates in 1974, you know, and it's virtually falling apart. And I'd coloured in the brain on the Martian and stuff. So, yes, yeah, so that's my original. I can't get, I can't let this go because, you know, sentimental value. Um, but, you know, so it was great to get a really pristine one, which is actually older. Fantastic stuff. And it was dead cheap. So you can't really, you can't really complain about that. You know, it's just great stuff. Also, here's another old favourite. This is my original copy of 2001. A Space Odyssey by Arthur C. Clarke, based on the screenplay by Stanley Kubrick and Arthur C. Clarke. And this really has seen a lot of action. Look at that. Look at the state of it. And I've read and reread this as a kid. And this edition is from, let me just have a look. This is from 1976, summer of 76. So I just turned 13. And, you know, it is a state and it's really browned. But I read and read and read this. I read loads of times. So I must have read this book 20 times easily. And I'm not a massive Clark fan, that's the thing. But I did love this and I love the ideas and the scope of it. And I love this cover. And I say this is in a total state. So, and it was 60p on the price in the back. Now that's important because I'm going to show you what I got in Adamant. And I got a copy with the same jacket, same livery. Spiffy, look at that, like new, gorgeous. Slightly different, you notice the price block there, and on my old one there isn't a price price block, otherwise it's pretty much the same. When you look at them side by side, and you see, you see um, look at that, absolutely gorgeous. So I sort of pounced on that, I've got to have that. And um, this was published, um, let's have a look. This copy is three years later, I think. I did have a look earlier on. Yeah, this is a 79. And it's £1.10. So between 76 and 79, nearly doubled in price. 60p, £1.10. Just shows you how things were inflating in the late 70s in book prices. Really quite something, but yeah, absolutely gorgeous. When I was in there, Derek actually had a hardcover of 2001 um, with a film tie-in cover with a picture of um, of Bowman on the front, um, Keir Dahlia. And it's a bit of a leaning spine. It's in good nick otherwise. It was 300 quid. So I said, oh, I'll leave this one, Derek. So, you know, but we had a good chat and stuff. And, um, you know, he does have some tempting stuff, but that's not going to happen. Do you know what I mean? But there's there's several different ones with, with film tie-in jackets and um, worth looking out for. But they're always really expensive. And usually they're like this, but worse. So, you know, so that was great to get. So it's great to get to have those two beautiful editions of two of my oldest favourites. So Arthur C. Clarke still, this is a book I've never owned. I have read parts of it. I think I've read some of the school library. And this is Tales from the White Heart and with a lovely squid cover. And as you see, it says Sidgwick and Jackson. Now, because Sidgwick and Jackson were affiliated with Pan and it had this, um, this jacket in hardcover. And it had, the one I remember, I think is an NEL one, which is slightly later, it might be a Pan one. And a picture of Arthur on the back and it's got black on the back of it. This is white on the back. And of course, the White Hart was the sort of pub in London where, you know, all the um, SF um, writers used to go to. And this was in the 60s and 70s. And, you know, there's stories from Michael Moorcock about the time that he introduced William Burroughs to Arthur C. Clarke and they got on like a house on fire and stuff, you know. And um, this is about a chap, um, presumably a fictional character, who hangs out in the White Hart. And um, he's called Harry Purvis and he's a raconteur and he tells strange tales of science fiction, fantasy and possibly horror. So, so I've read some of these a long time ago. But yeah, absolutely great. And I love that as a title for, you know, for an SF um, collection. Tales from the White Heart. The Clubhouse story is a really old genre and hardly anybody does it now. But it was often used as a frame narrative, of course, by people like Kern and Doyle and a lot of the sort of classic Victorian Edwardian writers. writers. Great stuff. So absolutely beautiful as well. Lovely. So really pleased with that. So it's a bit of an Arthur C. Clark thing. And I finished off my Clark scores with this rather nice New English Library NEL Prelude to Space. So never buy a book with gold lettering on the cover. That's what we used to see in the 80s. But look at that. Isn't that fantastic? So yeah, and I've never read this one. And um, yeah, it's great stuff. So 
Yeah, so vintage Arthur C. Clarke novels. So I do find Clarke very clunky and I do find him hard to read sometimes because I'm reading his work and I'm thinking, no, he could have done that better. That could be better. So I'm kind of editing him, you know, even though, you know, he's made loads of money. He was really successful. So what do I know? But there you go. But yeah, so I was really pleased with that. Absolutely beautiful. So yeah, and I am very drawn these days. If I see books which I have to sell or stock or remember from my youth, which are in tip top condition, you know, unless they're stupidly expensive, I just have to have them because, you know, you, you won't see them. There's not many out there, you know, and it's usually sadly when people die off and they, you know, their collection gets donated to second hand bookshop that you see these things. So you have to snap them out because there's not many out there. So there you go. I'm um, going back to Bob Shaw. <clears throat> uh, Bob Shaw. I wasn't sure whether I'd go for this if I came across it. This is a door edition of Firepan, which is one of his novels from the... Um, mid 80s i think this is about 85 86 let me have a look and i read this when it first came out 84 and i can't recall whether i read the golang's hardcover um because i don't have that or maybe it was a pan paperback and it started really well it's about spontaneous human combustion fascinating subject and then it just got really silly and i didn't like it um but you know i'm going to give it a go again i felt i wanted something more out of it it turned into a fairly conventional space extraterrestrial narrative and i wanted more than that from shaw especially to reading things like other days other eyes i thought he'd do something really radical with shc and he did it in some ways i guess but it wasn't radical enough it turned into a conventional science fiction novel and i wanted an unconventional one but you know it goes back in the archive in the shaw collection so that's good and a door one quite nice that yeah you know door obviously a drop there classic yellow livery by that point so not quite the same but it is what it is something that i was looking for a while ago i decided that i was going to try and get this book blackpool vanishes by richard h francis more commonly known as richard francis he's still active he's written all sorts of novels he's not very well known but he is critically acclaimed um he lives somewhere in bath i don't know if i must have served him at some point in bookshops there i've never knowingly i don't know what he looks like so uh, maybe i should try and get in touch with him and say hi and get this signed because i did think about trying to get a faber copy of this and there are some faber ones out there hardcovers and i read this years and years ago and it is a science fiction novel but it's more like a sort of pastiche of one you just get the feeling that he wasn't taking it entirely seriously and there's a similar book from the 80s this is from the 70s um a similar book the 80s called the krug syndrome by somebody called mccallister something is it graham mccallister i can't remember and you know that was marketed as sf but it was more like a pastiche or a parody of it and um it wasn't, wasn't that great and this what I remember is I think this is in the same ballpark, except this was better. So I am going to have to reread it. But anyway, Derek Adaman had a copy there. It was signed. It was 25 quid. It was on Abe book. So I knew it was there. So I thought I'll have a look at it. I had a look at it. It was, it was okay. It was very good. Um, very good to excellent. I really wanted one that was kind of mint for 25 pounds, um, even though it was signed. And I thought, well, this has got a Jim Burns jacket. I love Jim Burns. Um, you know, it's probably not going to be a major thing in the collection. I can live without a Faber one. If, if it'd been mint at £25 signed, you know, I, I might have gone for it and done some horse trading because Derek has often given me 10% off because I'm a bookseller because um, he's a good guy. So I went for that and Jim Burns jacket. So there you go. So that was a compromise. And sometimes compromise is a good thing, you know, you, you don't spend so much and, you know, you've got to decide what you need in what format in your library. However, what I did score big time with, ha ha ha, um, occasionally, it's not often this happens, but sometimes you will get a real pro and they will miss a book which is quite hot. And in this case, um, I'm afraid to say that the Adamant team missed this. This is Fred Saberhagen, Empire of the East, as you can see in MacDonald. And this is a surprisingly uncommon book. I've got a, quite a few of these McDonald's in this livery and they're really nice. They're from the sort of late 70s, early 80s. Let's just check the date of this. They do all tend to have toned paper because there's no, there wasn't acid free paper then. Yeah, this is um, 84. So they're early 80s. I've got some Larry Nevins. You see a lot of Barry B. Long years in this. I'm not that fussed on Long Year. Enemy Mine. You ever seen the film Enemy Mine? That's a laugh, isn't it? Um, but this was there the last time I went and the time before and I didn't pick it up and it had a nice library jacket on it so I've taken the library jacket off and it's absolutely spiffing and mint underneath really shiny and this is an uncom uncommon book and I became aware of this a while ago because Andy at Coltenage um, had one on sale 
and I think he had it on sale for, I can't remember, but it was, it was well over 50 quid. And I think he's got another one on sale now, and I think it's 75. And I have seen it go for over 100 pounds. And my friend Graham, he of the stunning SF collection, you know, there's that video I did where he's got about 10,000 books. He had one and he sold one. I think he sold it for about 40 quid. I'm not sure. Now this one has been rebound. So it's bound in a kind of faux leather, but it's probably much nicer than the original binding. So, you know, in theory, that, you know does that detract from the value um because it it had been written in here um Dirk had written you know rebound and you can see it's been rebound because there's a, a white strip down there but i'll be honest and i'll say you know it's still the first there's still the, the original text block obviously and you know all the the colophon is there behind the full title page the jacket is absolutely gorgeous no price clipping it's really shiny and lovely as you see and this is a fantasy trilogy by the way and you know and it was um eight pounds fifty so if i decide to keep it it's a good score if i decide to sell it on i'll easily triple my money on it so we'll see so i'll hang on to it for now <clears throat> i'll have a think about it and at some point i may move this on um saber hagen i think is relatively minor um he's never really blown me away this is a fantasy trilogy and it precedes a, a series called the sword series the first book of swords i've got that in this livery as well but you know as to say partially it's a nostalgia thing it's a rather laughable jacket i can't really i can't really get on with this guy here he's not happening for me it's a bit of a silly jacket but it's in beautiful condition but it just goes to show sometimes even the most professional booksellers will drop the ball because you can't know everything nobody knows everything that's the whole point i don't know everything you know that specialists don't know everything you know we all we're all learning all the time about books so i was really really pleased with that emperor of the east fred saberhagen uk first edition mcdonald eight pounds fifty not 75 quid ha ha just after talking to Anne at Daddy Man about the fact that I wanted a couple of John Sladek crime novels, Invisible Green and Black Aura, um, I just sort of walked out the door, I was about to walk in, I can't remember which. And We've got Invisible Green somewhere in there. Have you? And also... Um... So I've emailed her this morning and, and we'll see. So I might be able to nail those two rare Sladeks, which I want, which would be fantastic. But yeah, real pro, you know, straight away, as soon as you express an interest, they're looking to see whether they get it. You know, they're hungry for the sale. Warms the heart, it really does. <laughs> not really collecting crime these days I'm having a bit of a break from it so I've read so much crime the last 10 or 12 years I've decided to take some time out for it this is a great shop I'll just show you Nice, isn't it? Yeah. Birds up here. Okay, so booths, in we go.
what did I get from Richard Booth? And well, you know, you get some good scores of Richard Booth and Jules loved it. And you know, when you watch his video, you'll see him wax a, waxing lyrical about it. He bought a load of um, new writings in SF, good series of anthologies. I've got loads and loads of myself and, and other things as well, as you'll see when you watch his videos to do, because he, you know, they're, they're great. And, and you know, he knows his stuff, Julian, he really does. So it's a joy, you know, to sort of hang out with somebody who's not only a friend, but also an expert as well. It's just brilliant stuff. So this was an odd one. <laughs> this is the only non-fiction book I bought. And um, it was in the SF section, as often happens with things which are a bit flaky. And this is quite a flaky book. I haven't read it. I've read about it. I remember it coming out at the time. And this is The Manor Machine. Look at that. And it's Granada, precursor of Grafton, my beloved Granada Grafton. And this is by George Sassoon and Rodney Dale, whoever they are. And this was a Sidgwick hardcover about 78. And this dates from 1980. And Anybody who watches the channel will know I'm a fan of a band called The Stranglers. And The Stranglers did an SF concept album in 1980 called The Men in Black. People often say it's called The Gospel According to The Men in Black because it says that above the title on the cover. But it doesn't say it on the spine. It doesn't say it on the label. The album is called The Men in Black. And this is years before that Will Smith film nonsense. Years and years and years and years. So the concept of The Men in Black, those strange mysterious figures that visit people who've had sort of close encounters of the third kind and what have you. Um, was first introduced into popular culture not by Will Smith but by the Stranglers my favorite rock and roll band so there you go and there's a song on um, the men in black called the manor machine as I think I might probably already have said that but I'll say it again there's a song on the album called the manor machine and it's about manor which is what the Israelites lived on for 40 years in the desert after they left Egypt as it says in the um, Old Testament so this is all about the manor machine and on the back it says the Lord was an extraterrestrial visitor. The Kabbalah is an operating manual for a nuclear powered manner making machine which was kept in the Holy of Holies for hundreds of years and could be found even now. I don't think anybody has found it since this came out but there you go. The manna was an amoeboid substance. So manna was single celled organisms. Okay right. Trying to go. Um, similar to foodstuffs being developed by our own scientists today. When was the last time you ate amoeba? Knowingly, that is. You said, could I have a box of amoeba, please? You know, a tub, I suppose it would be, wouldn't it? Um, only now do we possess enough form of technology to grasp these extraordinary facts. Mm, facts. The implications for our history and future is so enormous. Anyway, you get the idea, it's kind of 40 in thing. So I'm going to read this and I'll do a video just about it for my, um, for my friends who are Stranglers fans. So we'll see. So that was, that was an interesting one. But you do see it around, but it's unbroken spine, spiffing condition. So I thought, yeah, I've got to go for that. I've got to have the man machine. So that's a great one. And what else did I get? <clears throat> Trying to fill some gaps. Harry Harrison's Technicolor Time Machine, which I used to sell back in the day, 80s edition, nice. Um, Orbit A format. I don't feel I've got enough of Harrison and I think it's either this one or no it's Transatlantic Tunnel Hurrah is being made into a film or TV series by Simon Pegg of you know of Shaun of the Dead fame so that'll be interesting because he's a witty chap old Harry and he was he was great you know and Again, gap filling. I have been thinking recently about early Michael Bishop. There's one or two things I don't have. I considered looking for this in a Golanche yellow jacket. It comes in about 25 quid. So I saw this lovely sphere edition of Stolen Faces and you know, it's got a faded spine, but it's really nice apart from that. And that was a couple of quid. So I thought I'll have that. Um, it'll help fill a gap in my Bishop collection and it'll stop me paying 25 quid for a hardcover. You've got to economize where you can. And then I was very pleased to come across this, which again, I was going to get one online. It was about eight quid and there were four copies of this in Richard Booth's all together. And this is Earthwreck by Thomas M. Scorcia, which from Coronet, 70s. And Thomas M. Scorcia is the co-author with Frank M. Robinson of um, the Glass Inferno, one of the two novels which were filmed as The Towering Inferno. And I showed this in one of my um, earlier SF sort of collector's diaries. And I thought, I've always meant to read this. I always loved that title, Earthwreck, with the exclamation mark. Let's make it dramatic. So I thought I should pick that up and have a read of that because I've never read an, enough Scorcher or Robinson. Um, so yeah, so there's just a couple of quid. So I saved myself some money because it was a lot more online, as I say. Then somebody I think I've been thinking I should sort of go back to 
and fill some gaps. I just have a couple of books by them and I should probably sort of get the ones I haven't got. Um, is Joseph Green and this is Gold the Man. And I used to have a Golanx yellow jacket of this, which I sold and it was pristine. And I regret it. It's a strange book. And it's about um, a guy who pilots a giant alien. There's a giant alien body and um, it's dead. And they sort of hollow out the front of the skull and he pilots it. And it's just bizarre. And it was published under a different title in the States by Dawn. I can't think of the life of me. This is early 70s and um, it's a bizarre book. But strangely in... Stanislaw Lem's um, Fiasco, which is an amazing first contact novel, which is a Penguin modern classic these days, one of the best SF novels I've read in recent years. Really, really serious, fantastic first contact novel. Um, there's a bit in here where Ishan Tiji, um, who is um, one of Lem's perpetual characters, he is sort of driving this giant sort of robot and it reminded me of this very much. It's a strange sequence in a book which becomes very serious, but you know, that's Lem for you. You know, he's a playful sort of guy, huge intellect. So yeah, sort of Gold the Man, great title, love that title. I don't know why I ever go to my Gollum's yellow jacket, but like I say, you do these things and then you regret it. It is what it is. So I'm sort of picking up a few Joseph Greens. Um, what I haven't read, <clears throat> and these are not uncommon books, you know, they're out there, um, is Conscience into Planetary in Pan. Um, there are about five copies of this year, so I picked this up as well. I love that title. I am looking out for a Mint Millington hardcover of Star Probe, which is a book which is easy to get um, as a book club edition, but really hard to find the Millington UK hardcover first. Something that I've been thinking about that I'd like to pick up if I saw it, it was somebody, something I never bought back when it was in print. And this is Memoirs of a Space Woman by Naomi Mitchison, who was a novelist um, and writer of all kinds. And she wrote loads and loads of books. She's very acclaimed. Um, she never had massive bestsellers or anything. She wrote all kinds of things. And this is, um, this is her SF novel. And this was a Dobson hardcover. And this is Women's Press SF from the mid 80s in these, this gray livery. There's a sticker that won't come out for it, which is, a bit, which is a bit annoying from a shop in Bilt Wells, which is relatively near to Hay. Um, but you know, she, she's technically a mainstream novelist. So I've always thought I should read this. Um, so that'll be an interesting one. So I do like these women's press books. And the funny thing I've said at the time is that the only people I remember buying them back at that time were men, were male SF readers. So, you know, if you're sort of like a hardcore feminist, that's fine, that's your jam, that's okay. Don't come to me and say, oh, there were no women SF, women weren't welcome, blah, blah, blah. Absolute nonsense. Women's press were doing loads and loads of SF. And as I say, in my experience, I mostly sold it to men. So, you know, it's there. It was there for women to buy if women didn't want to buy it. I'm sure there are women who did buy it. If you're a woman and you did buy them at the time, please make a comment because I'd love to hear your experiences and what you like, which one's on the list. Um, because they do have a kind of austere feel about them, which is really, really nice in A format. They went to B later on, which wasn't so good. And I've read you know, quite a few books in that series. So I was pleased to get that because that's a relatively uncommon one. Frederick Paul. I blow hot and cold about Frederick Paul. Sometimes he's blown me away. Man Plus is an amazing book. Um, his collaboration with C.M. Cornbluff, The Space Merchants, aka Gravy Planet, that's a great one. Um, a Gladiator at Law, which I reread recently, another Cornbluff collab I really don't like, even though it's very clever. And what I've never read was this one, which was published under the name Edson McCann originally. And this is Preferred Risk, which I've always loved that title. And that's Paul and Lester Del Rey. Even though Del Rey and Paul will go, will go back to the 30s as fans and as early important people in publishing and SF writing and what have you, sort of golden age guys, I've never been that fussed on Lester Del Rey's writing and things like Nerves and Police Your Planet and what have you. But Preferred Risk, there's other copies out there. This is some um, really sort of really nice Del Rey paperback, funny enough. So Lester publishing his own books. His wife, Judy Lynn, um, was part of that as well. And of course, Lester's the guy who, um, you know, who bought the Shannara trilogy from Terry Brooks and started this dreadful fantasy boom that we've all suffered from ever since, where everything has to be a million volumes long, goes on and on and on. It's the size of the planet. And OK, at least it's gone from Tolkien-esque to grimdark. 
but oh god it's really made a mess of things and it's lowered literary standards fantasy usually is not well as well written as sf i know there's exceptions and you know it's the same old thing and you know sf and fantasy they get stuck together they're different things fantasy is more about escapism and the past and the symbolism of the past whereas science fiction is the novum the new thing turning the world upside down you could say they're both escapist and of course there's plenty of escapist sf but philosophically they're very different things i'm going to talk about that at length at another time in a more theoretical video so rant over um i think the last one that i'm going to show you in paperback i saw this and i grabbed it and i ran off to the till with it before i realized this got a huge ding in it there shocking um, but it's got a dinosaur on the cover and this is bayon and this is lynn sprague de camp um important fantasy writer rivers of time and yes another ray bradbury sound of thunder ripoff probably um, but it's got a dinosaur on the cover and i do like science fiction with the dinosaur on the cover so i kind of i decided to sort of ignore that i blocked that out i think semi-subconsciously and i went for it great fun and these were all like about two quid you know it's like um richard booth great prices and um the range is what it was it's very depleted to what it was a few years ago but there's still some good stuff there so i was very pleased with that I saw this the last time I was there and I thought about it. And this is um, Stuart Jackman, The Burning Men. Now, the last time I looked, um, I'm pretty sure that Stuart Jackman isn't in the SF Encyclopedia. I must have a look at the website. And I, I don't think he's on there either. And Stuart Jackman wrote this. This is the third of a trilogy. This is Faber. And I think it's from the early 80s. Um, let's have a quick look at it. The Burning Men. Um, 1976. This is 1976. And he wrote three of these. And I read the first one. The first one was called The Davidson Affair. Davidson, one word. Son of David. Because, of course, the lineage of Jesus Christ was, was the, the house of David. And what was amazing about it, I read it in about 86. And I don't have any more. Well, I did because it was a Faber paperback. Not an A format, not a B format, but in between. With a really sort of classy sort of Russell Mill style jacket. And it was about experiencing calvary and the crucifixion and everything around that um seen through the eyes of a, of a contemporary documentary filmmaker a few years later gore vidal wrote a book called life from golgotha which looks like this and life from golgotha is the same idea so you know was he aware of it because you can't copy out an idea but it felt like plagiarism to me but gore vidal obviously a very famous writer um lived in ravello in italy which is obviously a beautiful place i went there back in 2010 and you know nobody sort of noticed except me <laughs> so i think jackman was quite obscure now interestingly as i say this was their last time the time before and i looked at it it was five quid and i thought about it but it's the third in the trilogy and i didn't realize it was a trilogy so the first one's called the davidson affair the second one's called slingshot and the third one is this one, The Burning Men. And in The Burning Men, it says that TV reporter Cass Tennell is sent back to Jerusalem at the request of Caiaphas, the high priest, to make a pro-Jewish documentary feature on the Feast of Weeks. And in these books, um, Jesus is called Jesus Davidson. So it's hard to tell whether they're set in alternate history, whether there's some time slip thing and what have you. But they definitely have speculative elements. And I do remember the Davidson affair was very interesting. And so I got this for five quid. Whether I'll ever find the first one again, the second one, I don't know. Um, but it's stamped. This book belongs to the British Broadcasting Corporation Library. So I don't know whether they ever did a radio drama or what have you. Um, so yes, yeah, so it was bizarre. So it looked like a library book. I cleaned it up a bit. It's not in fabulous condition. The spine isn't leaning. The jacket's not too bad. And it was only five quid. So I'll give that a try because that's a real curio. And I shall let you know. However, the high point of the day for me was this, um, which I've wanted for years and years, decades, in fact and it's out there on the internet it's always really expensive because it's published by jonathan cape it was published way way back in let's have a look i know i'm keeping the suspense up now back in 1970 by knopf and then cape what does it say 1971 and this is kobo abay inter ice age 4 which dates back to the 50s 71 UK, Jonathan Cape. Um, bit of a rip on the back of the jacket. It's seen some action. 
um, this was really really cheap um, and five cred um, <laughs> couldn't believe it it's got a little bit of water damage on it this is a really uncommon book normally you're looking at, at least 30 pounds a minimum will cost you over a hundred a bay was sort of really important japanese modernist novelist most famous for woman in the dunes which was filmed as well in the 60s and recently his sf novel the arc sakura which is a later sf novel um, has been issued in penguin um, a format sf in their new sort of international classic sf series and i've wanted this for years this is regarded as the first modern full-length japanese science fiction novel um, so that is really quite important historically. I've always loved that title, Inter Ice Age 4. There's all sorts of different genre elements in it. So I was really pleased with that. So that was absolutely marvellous. And yeah, I would have liked one in better condition, but it's not bad at all. And for that price, astonishing. So that's what I got from the three shops we visited. Um, I didn't buy anything in Murder and Mayhem. Um, but I did have that exchange with Anne and I got my fingers crossed that um, she's going to source invisible green and black aura for me at a reasonable price. We'll see, I guess. And I'm just going to undertake a bit of a challenge the next few months. I'm going to try not to buy any books for two months um, because I have bought a lot this year and I need to catch up with my reading. And I've got some expensive dental work coming up. You can't sort of keep spending all the time. And even though I sold some stuff at Hay and covered a lot of the costs, um, you always feel, I'm looking now behind the camera, there's a pile of stuff on the floor, which I probably should have taken over. So I'm going to do some eBaying as well. I always do a little bit, so I'm going to do some more eBaying as well. So I'm going to do some selling and I try not to buy anything for too much. Now I know you love book hauls, but I've got some very clever plans. I'm going to do a retrospective book haul soon of SF fantasy and horror that I bought at an event a long time ago and I'm going to draw the books together and you're going to love it. It's going to be very interesting. So that's my third Hay and Y trip in a year out the way. I'm sorry there wasn't much footage of Hay itself. You'll see a lot more of me and Jules Burt on the two videos that Jules is going to do. Watch out for them. I did some filming for him. Um, I pop up in them and it was a great day out. Really, really good. And he absolutely loved it. He really enjoyed it. So hopefully we'll get back there again. Um, I may go again around about September, probably with a video widow and, you know, get to the bookshops I didn't get to and sell some more stuff and maybe pick up some more things. So this is Outlaw Bookseller. Thanks for bearing with me. Boy, I'm tired. This COVID thing is terrible, you know. And um, I hope nobody out there has got it. And if you have, look after yourselves. And please subscribe if you haven't. And I'll see you soon. Signing out. Bye for now.